In today's epistle, St. Paul explicitly warns us that in order to stand against the deceits of the devil, we must put on the armor of God, having our loins girt about with truth. With truth. But according to a recent survey done by evangelical Protestants, 66% of self-professing born-again Christians assert that there is no such thing as absolute moral truth. 56% of the same born-again Christians deny that men are capable of grasping the meaning of truth. And 57% could not say that an objective standard of truth exists. 66% say there's no such thing as absolute moral truth. 56% say that men are incapable of grasping the truth. 57% say, cannot say that an objective standard of truth exists. We can ask the Pontius Pilate question, what is truth? Is there such a thing as absolute truth? Can we grasp the meaning of truth? Does an objective standard of truth actually exist? Before we leave today, we'll each be able to answer those questions. Let's get started. There are two common usages for the word truth. Truth commonly refers either to truth in understanding or truth in speech. Let's take a moment to look at both these kinds of truth. Truth and understanding, which is also called logical truth, and truth and speech, which is also called moral truth. First, truth and understanding, logical truth. Logical truth means the agreement of the mind with the thing. This is my thumb, this is a microphone, that's a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. What did we just do? We made judgments which either do or do not correspond to reality. For example, suppose I make a judgment that this is my hand. If this is my hand, then the judgment agrees with reality, and so we say it's true. That's my hand. The mind agrees with the thing. Suppose someone makes the judgment that that's a statue of St. Scholastica. Since that's not St. Scholastica, that's St. Rita right there, that judgment does not agree with reality, and so we say that it's false. The mind does not agree with the thing, okay? So truth means a judgment which agrees with reality. That's my right hand. Error or falsity means a judgment which does not agree with reality. That's a statue of St. Scholastica. Truth is a correspondence between the mind and the thing, okay? That's logical truth. It's a judgment which agrees with reality. There's a correspondence between the mind and the thing. Okay, easy enough. Now before we go any farther, let's ask ourselves this question. When we're speaking of logical truth, is there any objective standard? Does an objective standard of logical truth exist? Of course. The objective standard here is reality. It's the facts. It's the things we're dealing with. Either this is my right hand, or it isn't. Either that is a statue of St. Scholastica, or it isn't. It isn't. It's St. Rita. How do we know that's a statue of St. Rita? By inspection of the statue, the object. We look at the object and we say, uh, that has to be St. Rita. It isn't St. Scholastica. The object itself is objective standard. We can see the wound in her forehead from the thorn and so forth. The object is the objective standard. Objective, it gives you a clue. Object. Okay. So, is there an objective standard of truth? Yes. When we're talking about logical truth, it's reality. It's the thing. It's the object we're looking at. It's the facts we're wrestling with. It's the statement. What about moral truth? Moral truth means the agreement of the speech with the mind. In other words, when what we say is what we think, that's true. What we say is not what we think, then either we're a previous occupant of the White House or it's false. And as everyone knows, we call that a lie. 
Now the one thing to notice here is that moral truth is not necessarily directly connected to the actual state of things. What do you mean, Father? Someone can be actually confused as to the real nature of things. In other words, he may be confused as to the logical truth of a situation. But as long as he speaks what's in his mind, he's not lying, no matter how far that may be from the actual state of things. He's confused, but he's not lying. Okay, for example, ridiculous example you remember. Suppose, for example, a man thinks he's a slice of rye toast. Okay, so if he thinks he's a slice of rye toast, and then he says so, is he correct with respect to logical truth? Of course not. He's a man. He's not rye toast. His mind isn't in agree with reality. But is he telling the truth, morally speaking? Yes, although he's certainly not completely saying, his speech matches what's in his mind. He's not lying. He's obviously wrong. Okay, now if he actually thought he was a slice of rye toast, but he said, I'm just a little old slice of white bread, then that would be a lie. Why? Because his speech wouldn't agree with what's in his mind. So moral truth means the agreement of the speech with what's in the mind. Okay, now let's ask ourselves the same question. When we're speaking of moral truth, is there an objective standard? Does an objective standard of moral truth exist? Of course. The objective standard is what's in the man's mind. That's the standard. If he's speaking what's actually in his mind, then there's a correspondence. All right, so we've seen two senses of the word truth. Logical truth means the agreement of the mind with the thing. Moral truth means the agreement of the speech with the mind. In either case, there's a correspondence. When something true, either the mind corresponds to the thing, you know, like this is my right hand, or the speech corresponds to the mind. That's my right hand. We've seen that the objective standard for logical truth is the thing itself, the reality, the statement, the object being considered. We've seen that the objective standard for moral truth is what the man speaking actually has in his mind. Okay, now let's get practical. Let's suppose we run into these very common confused people who deny that we are capable of actually grasping the meaning of truth. How can we help them get their minds right? It's easy. We tell this man the meaning of truth, logical truth, moral truth. Remember, logical truth means a correspondence between the mind and the thing. And moral truth means that the speech corresponds to what's in the mind. Then just like everyone in here, he'll know the meaning of truth. Okay, then how do we respond to someone who says there's no such thing as an absolute truth? Now before we answer that, it's worth pondering the remark made by that great bishop and doctor of the church, St. Francis de Sales. St. Francis de Sales personally converted some 70,000 Calvinists. St. Francis de Sales used to point out that we catch a lot more bees with honey than with vinegar. What does that have to do with anything? The point is, is that although when we're talking about these kind of things we could make sarcastic, wise-cracking remarks, it's easy to do, generally speaking, we're probably better and more helpful, at least by leading off being gentle. We're trying to win souls, not score debating points, but win arguments. We can drive away a soul by being sarcastic. There's times when sarcasm is called for, but generally when we're starting out, we want to be gentle with the people and just explain to them the reality. Let them be the sarcastic one if it's going to be that way, but we want to leave them with the impression of gentleness. We don't want to leave them in their error, but we want to gently correct them, okay? All right, so how do we respond to someone who tells us there's no such thing as absolute truth? Well, for starters, the old standby, it's pretty obvious, is a good lead-in. Okay, let me get this straight. Are you saying that it's absolutely true that there's no such thing as absolute truth? That's a good start, but we don't want to stop there. Then we want to teach you by gently giving a few examples. Okay, you say there's no such thing as absolute truth, I'm going to teach you a few. It's absolutely true, and will be true for all eternity, that this thumb is this thumb. It's absolutely true, and it will be for all eternity, that this thumb is this thumb. It's absolutely true that this thumb is not this thumb. 
And we can go like this, like that, okay? It's really easy to get sarcastic here, but you want to take it easy on them because, pe you know, it doesn't have to be profound. It's absolutely true. That's just the principle of identity, and that's the principle of non-contradiction right there when you're talking about it, okay? We're trying to win souls, not arguments. Keep that in mind. Okay, so how do we respond to someone who tells us there's no such thing as an absolute moral truth? Now they're getting off the reservation. We're getting pretty deep into enemy territory. We want to press this point a little bit. Okay, we could start by giving a big smile and say, since you don't believe in any absolute moral truths, can I borrow your credit card for a while? Nobody lives like this. Call them on that. But don't stop there. We want to press the point. Okay, if you're correct and there's no such thing as an absolute moral truth, then doesn't it follow that all someone really has to do is take the right point of view and Hitler becomes a real swell guy? Obviously, it's easy to get sarcastic here. We take advantage of this. You see, that's the one thing we have in common with, the, with these people is everybody knows Hitler's wrong. Don't ask me why everybody can admit that, but they can. So take advantage of that. We have one moral thing we can agree on. He's not a good guy. So call him on it. Okay. It's easy to get sarcastic, and with this one, after the lead-in, you might have to, because a lot of times if someone is on this and they're not legitimately confused, they're going to be justifying something, and that's why they're leading with this sort of thing. Anyway, let's review. When we use the term truth, we're talking about being in contact with reality. In the case of logical truth, we're talking about our mind being in contact with reality. In the case, we were seeing what's actually there. That's what we mean by contact. In the case of moral truth, we're, we're talking about our speech actually re accurately reflecting the reality that's present in our mind. What's going in or coming out is an expression of reality. Truth is an expression of reality, either internally, as in logical truth, or externally, as in moral truth. Okay, now let's take all this and briefly apply to what we learn to a newspaper article. Since we're dealing with a printed editorial, we'll get a little sarcastic. Here's a quote from a Catholic college newspaper editorial entitled, Opening Minds. Quote, In the real world, which is very similar to the college world, it is vital that we keep an open mind and refrain from judging others. There will always be that one person who will argue that the sky is green instead of blue. This proposition may sound ridiculous, but our duty is to respect it. The world would be chaotic without respect for an individual's right to his or her own opinion. Close quote. Let's hear that again. In the real world, which is very similar to the college world, it's vital that we keep an open mind and refrain from judging others. There will always be that one person who will argue the sky is green instead of blue. This proposition may sound ridiculous, but our duty is to respect it. The world would be chaotic without respect for an individual's right to his or her own opinion. Okay, she claims that our duty is to respect that one person who argues that the sky is green instead of blue. Wrong. Our duty is not to respect that person, but to correct that person. Reality is what it is. 2 plus 2 is 4, the sky is blue, there are 100 pennies in a dollar. She also claims that the world would be chaotic without respect for the rights of others' opinions, the rights to other opinions. That's another humdinger. The notion that the sky is blue, for example, is not an opinion, even in the college world, which is very similar to the real world. Remember, the objective standard is reality. The thing we're dealing with it, the fact, the object. This object is the sky. It is objectively true that the sky is blue, and it is objectively false that the sky is green, and stupid errors don't deserve our respect, period. Close the book. I don't care if she's the editor of a Catholic newspaper. Imagine what she'd say if we ran her bank account using her own principles. Excuse me, she says, there's some kind of a county error. I put a large deposit in my account, and there's simply no record of it. And we reply, well, in my opinion, which you have to respect, I really felt that I needed that money more, so I took it. It's vital that you keep an open mind, and please refrain from judging me. She's not going to respect this. How about this? 
In an even more ridiculous sign in an editorial, our helpful editor points out, quote, so what if the governor voted to legalize all abortion in the state of Kansas? Her beliefs are uniquely hers, and it is our duty to listen and respect them, not necessarily to agree with them. Close quote. Parenthetical remark. This is exactly what St. Paul is warning us about in the epistle. Spirits of wickedness. Okay. I'll read that again. So what if the governor voted to legalize all abortion in the state of Kansas? Her beliefs are uniquely hers, and it is our duty to listen and respect them, not necessarily to agree with them. We have to pity her parents. To give their daughter a so-called Catholic education, they probably spent enough money to buy a small island in the Pacific, and this is the sort of moral reasoning that this young Catholic woman is capable of. So what if the governor voted to legalize abortion? It's our duty to respect your beliefs. Well, I'm going to be sarcastic. Ooh, good argument. I don't know about you, but I'm really convinced. It's our duty to respect... See, look, let's play the game. So what if the governor voted to execute the prisoner? It's our duty to respect Pilate's beliefs? So what if the governor decided, uh, voted to uh, employ the final solution? It's our duty to respect Hitler's beliefs? Let's get serious. What does God say? Hate evil and love good. Amos 5.14. That's what God says. So, as if the cultural wreckage around us isn't evidence enough, we can see we have a very serious problem. When 66% of the Bible Christians can deny the existence of absolute truth, or when the editor of a purportedly Catholic newspaper in a college not far from here thinks that we need to respect people who argue that the sky is green instead of blue, that it's our duty to listen to and respect evil, wicked, diabolical beliefs. And you thought the right host example was ridiculous. Fair enough, Father. But why are we spending so much time on something this basic? It's essential for each one of us to be able to understand and defend these basic fundamental concepts. We've got to have a clear grasp of these fundamental notions in an age like ours. An age which could easily be called the age of the lie. The age of the mass media. Our culture is flooded with lies, confusion, and mental darkness. And so before we wade into the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness, we want to make sure we have a solid grasp on the basic concepts of logical and moral truth. Remember, logical truth means the agreement of the mind with the thing. Moral truth means the agreement of the speech with the mind. Logical truth means agreement of the mind with the thing. That's the Blessed Virgin Mary there. Moral truth means agreement of speech with the mind. I want everybody here to get to heaven. We have to be sure that we can defend these ideas. We want to be able to sure, we want to be absolutely sure we recognize objective truth. After all, we have it on very good authority that the truth will set us free.